The grace of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the sweet communion of the Holy Spirit be with you one and all. Welcome to the second Sunday in Lent worship service for Church of the Master Presbyterian Church located in Atlanta, Georgia. Once again, I am delighted that you have taken the time to worship with us virtually on this Lord's Day. Come with us now as we go forth in intentional worship of our triune God. Greetings. Please join me for our call to worship. I will tell of your name to my brothers and sisters and lead them in praise. You did not despise the afflicted nor turn a deaf ear when they cried to you. All the ends of the earth shall turn to you, O God. All families shall worship the Lord. We will tell of your deeds to those who follow and proclaim your deliverance to all. Let us worship God. Pray with me, church family. Heavenly Creator, Almighty, we thank you, we thank you, we thank you for this day. We thank you for this moment. We thank you for the opportunity to go forth and continue to serve as agents of love to your creation. God, we thank you. We ask that you bless us with wisdom, bless us with a measure of health, and bless us with the love that comes from family and friends and a church community. We ask that you keep us humble. We ask that you keep us hungry and eager to serve you in all the steps of our days. It's in the mighty name of Jesus Christ that we offer this prayer. Amen. Beloved, trusting in God's promise of salvation, let us now confess our sins and repent by praying together now our prayer of confession. Merciful God, we confess that we have not been sincere Christians. We claim to follow Jesus, but have not taken his path of sacrificial love. We profess to be disciples, but we are not willing to bear the cost of discipleship. We affirm the virtue of self-denial, but we indulge our selfish desires and seek earthly gain. Forgive us, we pray. Free us for sincere repentance through Jesus Christ our Lord. In his name we pray. Amen. Amen. 
Church, hear the good news, and it is good news. Anyone who is in Christ is a new creation. The old life is gone, and a new life has begun. Friends, believe the gospel. I declare to you in the name of Jesus Christ that you are, I am, we are forgiven. Now go and do likewise and be at peace. Please join me for our prayer of illumination. Holy Spirit, open our hearts to receive your word. Reveal to us the good news and enable us to trust in the promise of salvation in Jesus Christ. Amen. Our Old Testament reading will come from the book of Psalm, chapter 22, verses 23 through 31. Listen for the word of God. You who fear the Lord, praise him. All you descendants of Jacob, honor him. Revere him, all you descendants of Israel. For he has not despised or scorned the suffering of the afflicted one. He has not hidden his face from him, but has listened to his cry for help. From you comes the theme of my praise in the great assembly. Before you, before those who fear you, I will fulfill my vows. The poor will eat and be satisfied. Those who seek the Lord will praise him. May your hearts live forever. All the ends of the earth will remember and turn to the Lord. And all the families of the nations will bow down before him. For dominion belongs to the Lord, and he rules over the nations. All the rich of the earth will feast and worship. All who go down to the dust will kneel before him. Those who cannot keep themselves alive. Posterity will serve him. Future generations will be told about the Lord. They will proclaim his righteousness, declaring to a people yet unborn, he has done it. The word of God for the people of God. Good morning. I am Brendan Michaels, Church of the Master. Today, I will be reading from Mark chapter 8, verses 31 through 38. Jesus predicts his death. He then began to teach them that the Son of Man must suffer many things and be rejected by the elders, the chief priest, and the teachers of the law, and that he must be killed, and after three days rise again. He spoke plainly about this, and Peter took him aside and began to rebuke him. But when Jesus turned and looked at his disciples, he rebuked Peter. Get behind me, Satan, he said. You do not have in mind the concerns of God, but merely human concerns. The way of the cross. Then he called the crowd to him, along with his disciples, and said, Whoever wants to be my disciple must deny themselves and take up their cross and follow me. For whoever wants to save their life will lose it. But whoever loses their life for me and for the gospel will save it. What good is it for someone to gain the whole world, yet forfeit their soul? Or what can anyone give in exchange for their soul? If anyone is ashamed of me and my words, in this adulterous and sinful generation, the Son of Man will be ashamed of them when he comes in his Father's glory with the holy angels. Thank you, and may the Lord add his blessings to the reading of his word. Good morning, Church of the Master family. I'm blessed to be here with you guys again, uh, just to give a, a little offering for children's sermon. Um, today, I wanted to talk about a difficult journey. In our New Testament reading, uh, we find Jesus telling his followers 
that he's about to face um, a difficult path ahead and that they were all going to be witness to that difficult path. He shared with his disciples that he would be persecuted and that he would not be accepted by a lot of the prominent religious leaders uh, of that time. And his followers didn't understand. In fact, Peter pulled Jesus to the side and started criticizing him and saying, you shouldn't say things like that. But Peter didn't understand. None of the followers understood because they had the thoughts of men and not the thoughts of God, but Jesus knew God's plan. And so he proceeded to tell them of what was to come. Now, I have a question for you. If you knew that the road that you were about to go down was gonna be a little difficult, would you still go down that path? Well, Jesus basically told the followers that day that I'm gonna have this journey and if you choose to follow me, you too will have that journey. When we look at the International Children's Bible version of Mark 834, it says, if anyone wants to follow me, he must say no to the things he wants. He must be willing to pick up a cross and follow me. And we all know where that cross bearing led for Jesus. So I ask you again, when you know the road's gonna be difficult, what will you do? Well, when we choose to follow Jesus, we know that there will be times where we might face some difficulty when in having to make the right choices or in having to do the right things. And at times we may be discouraged. Sometimes people might even make fun of us. But what we know, because we know the good news, is that none of that matters because those are the thoughts of men. We know that when we choose to follow Christ's example, it is worth the effort. Not only do we gain life everlasting, but we save our souls. And isn't that what this life is really all about? In Mark chapter eight, God says, what does it gain a man to have the world but lose his soul? And so I know like you, like me, we have chosen to follow Jesus. And even though it gets difficult, I'm here to remind you of that great news. It's all worth it in the end. Amen. Please bow your head in prayer. Oh, gracious and eternal Father, we thank you for this wonderful life that you have bestowed upon us. We ask that you continue to watch over us, protect us, and keep us safe from all evil, harm, and danger. Please send your angels down to surround us and grant us your peace. Dear Lord, please be with the families that have been affected by COVID-19. Please strengthen them. Please give them the courage and understanding that you alone are God and all things will be well. Please protect all the frontline workers. Please protect each and every person in and out of hospitals, facilities, and any medical institutions. Please guide them, protect them, and grant them your peace. Oh God in heaven, we pray for the world. We ask that you remove all evil. We ask that you give everybody a sense of hope, peace, and happiness. We ask that you cover us. We ask that you continue to love us. And please, Lord, never take your hand off of us. We ask that you continue to let our church grow and be protected by your word. Lord God, we thank you. We give you all the glory, honor, and praise. This is the prayer of the people. In Jesus Christ's name we pray. Amen.
greet you in the magnificent name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus the Christ. I bring you special greetings from our specialized ministries of the Presbytery of Greater Atlanta. It is a joy to be with you. All of you know how I feel about my sister of sisters in ministry, the Reverend Dr. Cecilia Taylor, to the members of this session, and to all of you who call Church of the Master your home church. God bless you and thank you for allowing me to be with you today. Let us pray. Glorious God, we thank you for your presence. We thank you for your purpose. We thank you for the prophetic word as you illuminate our minds, as you open up our spiritual hearts that we might receive nuggets of wisdom from you. Labor with us, Holy Spirit. Don't let us go. Bless all who hear this word to marinate with it that they might be inspired to do your will more fervently, more faithfully. In Jesus Christ's name we thank you, amen. Our message today, has the goal been met, comes from the New Testament, the gospel lesson in Mark 8. Mark, as we know, was the first gospel written. At least that's what they told Cecilia and I when we were in seminary. It's also the shortest of the four gospels, but it is the gospel that gives us the action of Jesus Christ's divinity. If you want to see the Lord in action, you go to Mark. The divine power of God working through the Son of Man that lets us know He is divine. He is the Messiah and the street name is Son of Man. And so we turn to the eighth chapter. I will be reading from an NRSV translation for you from verses 31 through 38. Then he began to teach them that the Son of Man must undergo great suffering and be rejected by the elders, the chief priests, and the scribes, and be killed, and after three days rise again. He said all this quite openly, and Peter took him aside and began to rebuke him. But turning and looking at his disciples, he rebuked Peter and said, Get behind me, Satan, for you are setting your mind not on divine things, but on human things. He called the crowd with his disciples and said to them, If any want to become my followers, let them deny themselves and take up their cross and follow me. For those who want to save their life will lose it, and those who will lose their life for my sake and for the sake of the gospel will save it. For what will it profit them to gain the whole world and forfeit their life? Indeed, what can they give in return for their life? Those who are ashamed of me and of my words in this adulterous and sinful generation, of them the Son of Man will also be ashamed when he comes in the glory of his Father with the holy angels. The word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Has the goal been met in the very first section of verses 31 and 32? Jesus sets the standard for what we will focus on today. Jesus tells us that there's something imperative that must be done. There are some things that can't be overlooked. There are some things that are must. That word must, that verb must. Those things that cannot be bypassed those imperatives must he must come he must be born must he must live he must succeed king herod's plots against his infancy imagine the head of the government trying to wipe out your childhood before you get started because he fears you and so all of these innocent children were slaughtered because he wanted to take jesus out Listen to verse 31, just a, a portion of this sentence. Then he began to teach them that the Son of Man must undergo. And after that verb phrase, must undergo, there were seven goals to be accomplished. And the seven verses in this section of the text correlate with those seven goals that have to be met. He came to live. He came to lead. He came to suffer. He came to die. 
he came to rise. He came to save. All of those are musts and all of those are goals. We define goals in our leadership context as ideas that must be accomplished. Visions that must be accomplished. And I look at goals as having one of three or some combination of the three attributes. There are spatial goals, there are chronological goals, and there are differential goals. A spatial goal is like where we're standing now, Aviation Park in Kennesaw, Georgia. This particular land mass, this particular space of the earth was a goal that it would be used for the public, for enrichment, for personal leisure, for families, for children, for pets. Spatial, a sacred space, a set aside spot, a designated area can be part of a goal or can be the goal. The White House, thank you, Benjamin Banneker, for putting it where you put it on 1600 Pennsylvania Avenue. The Capitol, Benjamin Banneker, a, a tobacco farmer, 100 acres that he inherited from his parents, working with his neighbor who was a cousin of George Washington to map out the District of Columbia, our nation's capital. Benjamin Banneker had a spatial goal every day that he had to work towards accomplishing so that you and I might get federal funds when we need them. Thank you, income tax returns. We're all are waiting for that check to come back. Some people are waiting on stimulus resources. Nevertheless, there was a spatial goal, and Benjamin Banneker in this month as we conclude African American history was involved in making sure that spatial goal was accomplished. And then there are goals we call chronological. I'm going to start something at 7 a.m. and I'm going to finish it by 10 p.m. Or I'm going to start something at 2 p.m. and I'm going to finish it by 3 p.m. Those are chronological. There's a time factor involved, a starting point and an ending point. And it's all focused around a timeline. Our births, we are allegedly to be in the womb nine months. Some of us have been in the womb four months. Some of us have been in the womb seven months. Nevertheless, whether you are here prematurely or maturely, there was a time factor. There was a chronological sequence from your beginning and to the goal being accomplished. And then there are differential. That is the goal that there's a darkness in a situation and we want it to become light. There are old situations that we want to make new, past situations that we're going to flip around and reteach differently in the present or in the future. So there are spatial goals, there are chronological goals, and there are differential goals. Jesus had seven that he must meet. He said, I must undergo suffering. I must undergo rejection. I must undergo abandonment. I must undergo mistreatment. I must undergo being lied on. I must undergo people thinking I'm crazy. I must undergo all of this so that the ultimate goal is accomplished. I mentioned Benjamin Banneker. I think about W.B. Du Bois. I think about Harriet. Tupman, I think about the Reverend Dr. James Coston, I think about all of these great people in our ancestral lineage as African Americans who could not have accomplished their goals had Jesus not accomplished what he is explaining to his disciples in Mark 8th chapter. Coming, living, leading, suffering, dying, resurrection, and saving. Rising again, he told the disciples. I will suffer, but I will rise again. I will be dogged out, but I will rise again. I will leave you, but I will rise again. 
And here's Peter saying, wait a minute, Lord. Uh, this is making no sense now. You are um, the son of man. You are the Messiah. You're not going anywhere. And knowing that nothing could interfere with the goal, Jesus shut him down. There's so much you and I need to shut down so that we can accomplish the goals God has called us to. There's so many people in our ear, conversations in our thoughts that we need to shut down, shut out, knock them out of the way so that we can accomplish the goals foreordained for our lives. God is counting on us just as Jesus was being counted on. Imagine now, more than 2,000 years ago, there was no e-blast for Jesus to send out. He was talking to the 12 and the, to the crowd. One by one, Jesus said, my goals must be accomplished. The word must reminds us of necessity. Jesus uses it to make sure the disciples understand this is not something he is going to overlook and he doesn't want them to overlook it. In 1906, right here in Atlanta, the late and wonderfully great Walter White was a child and he survived the race riots that ravaged Atlanta's Negro community. He saw everything that his family owned and his neighbors owned burned to the ground. But he survived and he made a choice as fair complexioned as he was to not pass but to own up to the fact that he was Negro. In his adult years, he became very involved with the NAACP and social justice and civil rights for African Americans in the United States of America. And one of the things that he was just dogged about was connecting the melodious voice and presence of the late Marian Anderson with the movement. There just needed to be a different twist to how things were being presented in the media and to the greater public. And it took some time. He had to appeal and appeal and appeal. All Marian Anderson wanted to do was to use her voice to sing, to celebrate that gift that the Lord had given her. She was not looking down on African Americans, it just wasn't her calling. But over time, as she witnessed social injustice after social injustice, she was moved to cooperate and work with Walter White's vision. He had a goal and he wanted that goal met. It was something that had a must ingredient in it. It could not be overlooked. He would not let it go. It was necessary for the advancement of people of color in this nation. And so we have the concert that took place on the steps of the Lincoln Memorial in Washington, D.C. Marian Anderson standing in a city that had been mapped out by Benjamin Banneker, singing to God's glory and hopeful that that image and her presence and the power of her gift would move the hearts of decision makers, shot callers, and the government of these United States of America so that more freedoms would be accorded people of color. Must live, must lead, must suffer, must die, must rise, must save. Jesus of those seven imperatives, those seven musts, those seven action items, those seven goals that could not be neglected, meant for us to be saved so that Walter White and Marian Anderson could stand in a spatial goal accomplished by Benjamin Banneker and make it possible for me to stand here today in Kennesaw, Georgia and deliver this message. Must save. Our salvation was the bottom line. Our deliverance from evil and wickedness was the bottom line. Spatial goal, check. Chronological goal, check. 
differential goal check. Living in darkness versus living in light. Living facing eternal damnation versus eternal deliverance. Yes, those were musts for Jesus Christ. And even Peter had to be silenced. So I ask you today, who must you shut down? What must you silence so that you can get back on track for the kingdom assignment, the goal that the Lord has given you? Church of the Master with this beautiful sanctuary with your amphitheater that could be filled with the melodious sounds of music being sung, being played on instruments. What must you do to make sure the goal the Lord has set for you is met? In my hospice chaplaincy role, there is an area of documentation that I must provide for every patient that I meet. And there's a question that I'm asked every time that I am completing my charting and documentation for every visit. It's the one that I pose to you. Has the goal been met? Has everything been done for this patient? Has everything been done for this family in terms of preparing them for the eternal transition that is to come? The imminent, imminent dying that is to come. The imminent bereavement season that is to come. Has the goal been met? Are they prepared? Have you done everything you've been instructed to do to help them get ready? Salvation, evangelism, reaching out, being a witness, being light where there is darkness. All of that is God's call on our lives to help people get ready. Has the goal been met? Have you done everything you are supposed to do to get people ready? Children, parents, adults, families, singles, elders, matters not who it is, have you done what is required to get people ready? That is what God is calling us to do. The Lenten season and how it starts in the middle of the month that we celebrate African American history. So it can't get any better for blacks who are Christian believers to have both seasons occurring simultaneously to celebrate what Jesus Christ has done for us to ensure that the enslavement of our people didn't wipe us all out. The humiliation and the social injustice that was projected upon people for hundreds of years didn't take us all down. That salvation meant that millions died, but millions were saved, millions survived. I am so grateful that an Irish grandmother taught her grandson, Benjamin Banneker, how to read and write. I'm so glad that his freed parents had that 100 acre tobacco farm that they could pass on to him. I am so glad that in his senior years, when he was about my age, he connected with the job of all jobs, working with George Washington's cousin to survey Washington, D.C., to decide where every street would go, where every lot of land, every mass, every spatial goal would be set in place. I am so glad that when I fly into National Airport in Washington, D.C., I'm standing on sacred ground that Benjamin Banneker walked all those years ago. And thousands of years ago, Jesus walked this earth so that we might be saved and safe to carry forward the Great Commission. Go ye therefore, Church of the Master, because Jesus says it is a must that you do. It is necessary. It cannot be overlooked that you reach out to people, that we move beyond pandemic-itis, that we move beyond pandemic fears, that we get our vaccinations, that we go out and see about other people still the kingdom of God will not be shut down because of a virus. 
The kingdom of God will not be shut down because of fear. We will pray our way through and we will remember our history says we have overcoming power. It's in our DNA and we will do as Jesus did. We will face the must do's on our agenda and we will get the work done. Because we all want to hear that principle of principles, the divine one saying, well done. Yes, Lord, well done. Thank you, holy God. Well done, good and faithful servant. Well done. Amen, amen, amen. We turn now to the service of giving for this Lord's Day. Again, thank you for your generosity to this church and its ministry. Beloved scripture says, what will it profit us to gain the whole world and forfeit our life? With humility, let us make the offering of our time, talent, and treasure to our God by giving generously. Would you please give? Again, thank you for your generosity. Pray with me, please. Loving God, we acknowledge that all things come from thee and it's from thine own that we have given thee. Kindly accept these gifts of time, talent, and treasure given on this second Sunday in Lent and use them for the upbuilding of your kingdom right here on earth as we anxiously await the day of your magnificent return. It is in the name of your Son and our Savior that we pray. Amen. Amen. Good morning, church family. And here are your church concerns for today. Please remember those individuals who are on our healing and recovering list. Von Seal Anderson, Ann Bryson, Maddie Burns, Gregory Cooper, Terry Davis, Elder Annie Edwards, Elder Annie McDonald, Clavon McNeil, the mother of Deacon Sheila Meadows, Deacon Karen Thomas, Elder Katrina Thomas, Ozzie Tuggle, the mother of Maria Lawrence, and Elder Michael Williams, the brother of Mary Myron Williams, excuse me. And also, please do not forget those families who are grieving the loss of a loved one, the family of Carolyn Gladson, the family of Jacqueline Early, the family of James Beasley, the William Tanner family, and the family of Carlton Bryson Sr. And let's not forget those birthdays that we had this month. Pierre Edwards, Nicholas Berenger, Darlene Wilford Bay, Annie Edwards, Reverend Paul Roberts Sr., 
Cynthia Boxdale, and Arthur Jones all celebrating a birthday for the month of February, and I hope it was a good one for everyone. And then our anniversary couple, Ken and Mary Tanner McCain, happy anniversary to you. Also, don't forget our Linton Bible study starts on Wednesdays at 7, 8, oh, excuse me, Wednesdays at 8 p.m. Uh, it's really good discussion. Hope to see you there. Then it's Zoom, 8 p.m. on Wednesday. Last but not least, please don't forget our congregational meeting, which will be via Zoom, March 13th at 10 a.m. And look for some additional information as we get closer to the date. Do hope to see you there. It's always good to see everyone when we can. Thank you very much. Have a great day. Paul Robeson was born April 9, 1898 in Princeton, New Jersey to William Drew Robeson, a runaway slave, and Maria Luisa Bustle of the prestigious Bustle family of Philadelphia. His father put himself through Lincoln University with a degree in divinity and became a minister of the Witherspoon Street Presbyterian Church, also known as the First Presbyterian Church for the Colored. His mother helped found the Free African Society and maintained agents in the Underground Railroad. She, when Paul was just six years old, died in a house fire. His father then moved the family to Somerville, New Jersey, where he became pastor of the St. Thomas a &E Zion Church. Reverend Robeson preached race pride and strong self-esteem, which he instilled in Paul. Paul found his voice as a singer there. In his senior year of high school, he takes a statewide examination and wins a full scholarship to Rutgers University. His academic record was astounding, and his record in college football was even more so. When he first went out for the team, as the only black, he was purposely singled out, brutalized, and battered on the field by the teammates. He wanted to give up, but his father tells him, if you quit, there'll be other Negroes who'll never get the chance to play. He goes back to the tryouts and stands up for himself all six foot three of him, and he makes the team. He goes on to earn 14 varsity letters and an All-American citation. He also excels in the glee club at Rutgers, although he's not permitted to perform in any out-of-town engagements. He's inducted into the Phi Beta Kappa fraternity his junior year and graduates as valedictorian of his class. After graduation, he moves to New York to attend Columbia University Law School. He gets his law degree and is hired by a prestigious law firm. In 1921, he meets and marries Eslanda Good Cardosa and has a son, Paul Jr. And in 1922, he makes his Broadway debut in Taboo and then on to the Broadway hit show, Shuffle Along. In 1924, he meets pianist Lawrence Brown, who becomes his accompanist, and they begin to record music. He produces over 300 recordings in his lifetime. He performs full concerts of spirituals, or slave songs as they were called. He spoke and sang in 15 different languages. In 1928, he traveled to England for a London production of Showboat, singing the acclaimed Old Man River and it was widely received. He was also cast in a London production of Shakespeare's Othello in the title role. His Broadway performances of Othello ran for two years and commanded 296 performances. Having endured the hatred and racism that was so prevalent in the United States, his world travels leads to his strong belief in socialism, and he involves himself with the fight of inequality all over the world. 
After World War II, he continues his campaign for the rights of African Americans around the world. And because of this fight for equality and his beliefs in socialism, he was called before the House of Un-American Activities Committee. He was denied his passport to travel overseas. After eight years of this denial, he won his passport back and went on to publish Here I Stand, his autobiography, or some say manifesto. He posthumously received countless awards and honors, such as the induction into the College Football Hall of Fame, the induction into the American Theater Hall of Fame, and the Grammy Lifetime Achievement Award. The singer-actor-activist battled prejudice and racism all of his life and refused to conform to either. He used unshakable dignity and courage learned from his father to break stereotypes and limitations. Paul Robeson died January 23, 1976 in Philadelphia. His amazing baritone voice was one of the greatest of his generation. Deep river, my home is over Jordan. Deep river, Lord, I want to cross A parting word. We'd like to start by just thanking all of our worship leaders for this Lord's Day, but especially our guest minister, the Reverend Yolanda Thompson. She always delights us and inspires us, and I'm sure that you have been dutifully fed on this Lord's Day. May the words that proceeded from her make a positive difference in your life this week. As we leave, I'd like to say to you, as disciples of Jesus Christ, do not shun the way of the cross, but follow wherever God may lead you. God will not take you. God will not lead you where the Holy Spirit cannot sustain you. So you trust that always. Now go in peace, knowing that God loves you, Jesus died for you, and the Holy Spirit is always around to support you and sustain you. Until we gather again virtually in this place, I am the Reverend Dr. Cecilia A. Taylor, pastor of Church of the Master Presbyterian Church USA, located in Atlanta, Georgia. See you soon.